This is Incredible Stories Podcast, Episode 40, The Golden Spruce. And hello again, everyone. It's time for another Incredible Stories podcast. I'm Josh Vierla, your Halcyon host, and thanks for being here. I will take a brief second and just ask our fans that have iTunes to make sure and give us a rating, preferably five stars, and this just allows more people to hear us. And that's good for everyone. Okay, Josh, what do you have for us this week? What is the Golden Spruce? Well, the story of the Golden Spruce is one of a legendary tree growing as an anomaly in British Columbia, Canada. The tree was prized by the native peoples of the region and Canadian citizens alike, until it was tragically cut down. What resulted was heartbreak and two mysteries that continue to this day. Here's what I know. The Golden Spruce was a very unique Sitka spruce growing on the banks of the Yakan River, which is the largest river on the Haida Gwaii, an archipelago on the north coast of British Columbia. The archipelago was formerly known as Queen Charlotte Islands, but what made this Sitka spruce so special was its color. You see, in an endless sea of green, this one tree stood out for being a remarkable golden color. Josh, I see yellow colored trees all the time. And yes, you might, but gold is not a color that a spruce tree typically comes in. This tree was not only golden, but picturesque. It was even and conically shaped that would remind anyone of an idyllic Christmas tree, except that it was nearly 170 feet tall and had a trunk diameter of about six feet. The marvelous tree got its Midas touch from a mutation that caused its needles to have 60% less chlorophyll than its brother trees. So special was its rare genetic mutation that it even warranted the tree its own scientific name, Picea sicensis aurea. Picea sicensis being the Latin for Sitka spruce, and aurea aptly means gold. This tree was even so special that the Haida people had their own name for the tree, which was significant because, as far as I can tell, they didn't have names for other trees. And they called this tree Kiyid Kiyayaz, meaning ancient or old tree. And again, I apologize for my pronunciation. But the Haida people so revered this tree that it had been a part of their cultural identity for many years. I reached out to the Haida Nation in hopes they would give me the account of their story relating to the tree. And to my surprise, they did! And if you're keeping up with my record of reaching out to official organizations, this time is special because they responded with the story. So I'll read for you what I received in my email about the tree known as Kied Kiyaz, aka the Golden Spruce, according to Jahal Jau who is the research writer for the Council of the Haida Nation Communications Program. Again, apologies for any names and or places I will mispronounce using the native Haida Nation tongue. Kied Kiyas was counted among our Haida ancestors. A young man failed to show universal respect bringing forth a terrible winter storm. A young boy and his grandfather survived the storm and left their village to find a new home. As they left, the grandfather told his grandson, Don't look back. If you look back, you will go into the next world. People will admire you, but they won't be able to talk with you. When you get too old and fall down, you'll grow up again. You'll be standing there until the end of the world. Don't look back. At last, his grandson looked back. His feet grew into the soil on the western bank of Yagun Gondola A, well within an afternoon's walk to Yagaan Kali Stalang, 2.6 kilometers to the north. His grandfather tried to recover his precious child, but with time the boy urged his grandfather to continue alone. His grandfather departed, saying, 
Everything will be all right, my son. Even the last generation will look at you and remember your story. At this time, the boy became Kiid Kiyas. The current generation is the first in many hundreds of years that hasn't seen Kiid Kiyas. Some people believe the murder of the person Kiid Kiyas heralds the end of our world. Perhaps the matter depends on whether his surviving incarnations grow to adulthood. And thank you so much to the Haida Nation for getting back to me. And if you'd like to learn more about the Haida people, I'll put a link to their website in the show notes, so check it out. Now, there are a few different versions of this story, and I'll link some versions in the show notes. Also, I can definitely see some similarities in this story to, say, those found in the Old Testament, with Lot's wife being turned into a pillar of salt. But for the Haida people, the golden spruce was considered a person, so cutting it down was akin to murder. But let's jump to 1924, when the golden spruce was first discovered by scientists. In the early part of the 1900s, big timber was big business, and Canada had a lot of big timber. So one day, when a Scottish timber surveyor, awesomely named Sir Wyndham Anstruther, was out surveying the forest, he came upon the golden spruce. And, so amazed was he, he later recounted, quote, I didn't even make an axe mark on it, being, I suppose, a bit overcome by its strangeness in a forest of green." Unquote. And he wasn't the only one left scratching his head after seeing this majestic tree. Some people at this time thought it was a new species of tree. Some thought it was just a lightning strike survivor. Still others just thought it was a sick and dying tree. But nay, it was not sick and dying. You see, the golden spruce had what is known as a chlorotic mutation. And you may sometimes see trees with this condition, but it is usually found in just a few branches. And it is thought that a tree with its entirety in this condition would not survive because it causes trees to have an intolerance of bright sun, which would in turn kill the tree. So a tree, in theory, having the same condition of the golden spruce, wouldn't last long in the wild, let alone lasting 300 years, as the golden spruce did. Weird, right? Well, as it is, the island where the golden spruce called home is sometimes called the Misty Islands, and the weather is seldom full sunshine, and it gets lots of rain. So I'm sure that helped. But this is just a theory, and really the golden spruce was an anomaly that makes it a mystery in of itself. So that's mystery number one. Now, some people did describe the tree as having a radiant brilliance when direct sunlight did hit it, though. I'm sure it was quite the sight to see. Okay, so this area of land was used for logging, and the land was leased out to logging companies to cut down trees, of course. Well, the logging companies are usually at odds with environmental groups, and the logging companies in this area were no exception. Let's enter into the mix the start of mystery number two. In January of 1997, a man by the name of Grant Hadwin ended up felling the tree in protest. But let me rewind a bit before I go further. Who is this bastard Grant Hadwin who cut down a beloved and unique tree? Well, Hadwin was a mountain man, or perhaps I should rephrase because the term mountain man may conjure up images of weirdo mountain hermits with grizzly bear pets, although this fellow was known as a bit of an eccentric. In the 1960s, as a young man, Hadwin worked as a lumberjack and gold miner in British Columbia, and doing this type of work in remote wilderness made Hadwin both a durable rugged figure, but also what one would probably call a survivalist today, like Les Stroud or to a lesser extent Bear Grylls. The point is this man knew how to live in the remote forests and how to stay alive. And he liked this way of living. He loved nature. So eventually he worked as a forest engineer. Basically a forest engineer helps better manage forests, You know, designate where the best places to cut are, and do it in a way that helps conserve forests, etc. The man knew his stuff. Perhaps he was a bit ahead of his time, too. Having concern for the forests and not being too happy with his company's way of going about logging made him kind of grumpy. Okay, let's go now to the 1990s. Hadwin, in 1993, was starting to come a bit unglued, it would seem. 
Experiencing episodes of paranoia, he went to go stay on an isolated Alaskan island for a bit. Apparently, on his way out there, his kayak got a hole in it, rendering it useless, and for the next 12 days or so, he just lived off the land. Survivor Man style. Now, the Coast Guard eventually rescued him, though, and later that same year, he crossed the U.S. border with a trunk full of needles and went about handing out condoms and needles in the streets of Washington, D.C. He was sort of an unofficial advocate for needle exchanges and safe sex. I'd think there would be better, more reputable ways of going about this, but hey, that was Hadwin for you. He then went on a needle-donating world tour, eventually getting arrested in Siberia. But thankfully, I suppose, he was able to return home with no real issue, other than looking like a kook ball with needles and condoms on his clothing. Okay, honestly, people were worried about the guy. I mean, he looked like a crazy man. By 1996, he was still unemployed and looking for work. Here is one of his cover letters, which he used to apply to a job. And I got this from the New Yorker, for reference. I do not like clear-cutting, and my philosophical differences with the forest industry run deep. If you are prepared to try a gentler approach to forestry, with less short-term profit, I may be able to help. I am familiar with the new buzzwords, such as forest renewal. All of forestry and most of the forest appear to need renewing, in some form or another. The job was for Forest Renewal Project Coordinator. He didn't get the job. So eventually he makes his way to the Haida Gwaii, the island where the Golden Spruce lived. By now, Hadwin was an unemployed 48-year-old. And on the night of January 20th, 1997, he swam across the Yalkon River, trailing behind him a chainsaw. Can we just stop and appreciate the fact that this guy swam with a chainsaw across the Canadian River in the wintertime? I mean, that is badass. Plus, he survived it even more badass. See, I told you, Survivor Man. Some accounts say he did this naked, which would make sense because that is a technique to survive cold river crossings. Anyways, Hadwin proceeded to make some cuts in the Golden Spruce. You see, he didn't cut it down directly. He just made deep cuts so that when the next heavy winds came, the tree would fall over. Well, two days later, this is exactly what happened. But Hadwin owned up to what he did. In fact, he wanted people to know he did it. He sent out faxes to various organizations and talked to the news media. So why did he do it? Well, he had been very disgruntled with the logging industry for years, and he said he did this as a protest against their awful methods. You know, clear-cutting and such. He targeted the Golden Spruce to be a kind of wake-up call. But instead of waking up the people to the logging industry, what he ended up doing was actually uniting everyone. Loggers, environmentalists, native peoples, they were all against him. This was a very special tree, you see. Hadwin, who seemed to not just have a bone to pick with loggers, but also university-trained professionals calling them, quote, an incestuous breed of insidious manipulators, unquote. His aim, of course, was the martyr of this one tree to help save the millions. He couldn't understand why everyone was hating on him. He said again, quote, Right now, people are focusing all their anger on me when they should focus it on the destruction going on around them. Unquote. Well, he was arrested and charged with criminal mischief and illegal cutting of timber. And the police didn't seem too keen on protecting him from the angry citizens all around him. Like, they didn't give him any bodyguards or personal escorts or anything. But he was released on bail. He was to stand trial in the village of Masset, a town on the Haida Gwaii archipelago. But he returned to mainland British Columbia. Now here's where Mystery 2 comes into play. Hadwin did intend to come back for trial, but he intended to kayak back. So he wanted to paddle himself from the mainland to the islands, which were roughly 60 miles away across the Hecate Strait. Crazy, right? Now, he did this because he was afraid that locals would attack him if he took the more conventional forms of travel, either a plane or a ferry. So on the evening of February 11th, his court date approaching on the 18th, he starts paddling. Now, people try to stop him because this is an insane thing to do. 
He was about to traverse 60 miles of open ocean in just above freezing temperatures with 40 mile per hour winds, rain, and nightfall coming. So he leaves, and the next day, remarkably, he's still alive. In fact, he had returned to get some warmer clothes. Probably a smart move. So he then heads out the next day, which was the 13th, but this time he didn't come back, nor did he arrive on the islands of his destination. It wasn't until June when pieces of his kayak were discovered on a small uninhabited island about 70 miles north. Oddly, the gear found near the kayak was in pretty good condition, and some think the find was actually less than a month old. So what happened to Hadwin? Well, no one knows. No body was found. Did he capsize? Did angry locals take revenge? Or did Hadwin simply fake his death and retreat into the wilderness? We'll probably never know. But what about the tree? Well, some partially good news. Back in 1977, botanists from the University of British Columbia took some cuttings from the golden spruce. They then grafted those cuttings onto normal spruce, and this allowed them to have golden spruce saplings. They sent one of the saplings to replace the fallen tree, but it died before it was replanted. And in the 1960s, some secret graftings were sold across the United States. So there's a lot of collectors that have specimens. But after the golden spruce fell in 1997, the top of the tree was sent to a research station and about 100 cuttings were taken from the tree before it died on the ground. These cuttings were grafted onto other spruce trees, and I believe about 60 of those survived. Some have been replanted and given to various communities affected by the loss of the tree, as well as some have been given to collectors who have been able to replant the saplings. It's hard to say for certain, but my research says that the Haida Nation received eight saplings, but not all survived, and it seems that the Haida Nation is tight-lipped as to where they planted all of them. And that's understandable, though. So there are some sons of the golden spruce all over ready to emerge when they are tall enough and strong enough to become the golden standard of their parent. Ah, but now there is some more to it. On the same islands where the golden spruce lived, it is rumored that there are other specimens of golden spruces, although not as picturesque as the famed fallen giant. Apparently they aren't as symmetrical and as uniformly golden. Maybe any listeners in that area can confirm other golden spruces or send in a picture. But that's the story of the golden spruce, how it died, and the mystery disappearance of the person responsible. And now you know what I know. So what do I think happened to our friend Hadwin? Well, personally, I think he faked his death and went and lived out into the forest. I mean, the guy was pretty good at doing that. Although we'll never know, of course. But there are many great trees across the planet, unique, ancient, and massive. The golden spruce, though, was one such tree that overlapped myth, science, politics, and true crime. The original golden spruce may have died, but its legacy of representing many things to many people still lives. The tree itself is not truly dead, as it survives in the form of its genetically identical saplings, and, perhaps in a few hundred years, they can become a literal shining beacon that reminds us all that there can be uniqueness in a forest. But it takes that forest to appreciate one's uniqueness. And now for something that literarily shines, the haiku. Oh, that golden tree. Don't cry, for it has fallen. Smile that it once stood. And that's all the time this week. Check out our main site for other stories on IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. Send me an email at contact at IncredibleStoriesPodcast.com. You can send me a haiku or show suggestion. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at IncredPod. Rate us on iTunes and peep us out on YouTube and Stitcher. For Incredible Stories Podcast, I'm Josh, and remember, the journey of a thousand tales begins with the first word. Sure.
sometimes now for 